we're sort of pre recession. I, I, well, I think we're actually in a recession if you look at the data, but they're not calling it. The financial conglomerate of media and government is not calling the recession. So we're not officially in a recession, even though people are suffering as we've been in a recession since the Great Recession. I don't think we ever actually came out of it. Welcome to Gold Silver Pros. Hey everybody, this is Rob Keynes with goldsilverpros.com. We're back with a weekly market wrap and it is Wednesday, November 8th, 2023. A little bit late on this one today, guys. Had a very, very busy week in the store. Plus, I wanted to let the news cure for a little while. There are a couple of things I was saying that I wanted to talk about. So <clears throat> we're doing our weekly market wrap today. We'll return to Tuesdays probably uh, next week. There's a whole lot to talk about. We're going to jump right into the economic data. Then we're going to get to a really quick synopsis of the markets on yesterday's data. Then we're going to talk about four big stories of the week and then end up with a precious metals report, as we always do. Going over the economic data, employment last week, ADP posted 113,000 jobs added, but lower than what economists expected, 130,000. The non-farm payrolls report from the government posted 150,000 jobs, but that was less than 170,000 expected for that report. They have different methodologies, hence the different numbers. We've gone over that in the past. Uh, I won't elaborate on that here, but just suffice to say that ADP has worked to try to align their methodology with the government, but the government is so inconsistent on their methodology, it's basically impossible to do. On the non-farm payrolls, the things to note are that part-time jobs are up again and full-time jobs are down. So even though we're adding net jobs, we're adding less quality jobs than people have had before. A lot of full-time work is being replaced by part-time work, and that comes with less benefits such as 401ks and uh, medical plans and things like that, pensions and things like that. The additional employee benefits you get as a full-time wage earner. In addition, people are working multiple part-time jobs to make ends meet who may have had previously full-time jobs or needed full-time jobs, which means that less overall people are employed overall, even though we've had more jobs. You can't assume that one job, one person, it doesn't work that way. People are working multiple jobs to make ends meet. And so therefore, the overall labor force participation rate, the graph that I show you guys at least once a month on the program, is going down and has never recovered since pre-2008, even with all the spending the government's done over the last 15 years. The September and August numbers for the non-farm payrolls have been revised, as they always are, and the trend is that they're always revised downwards. So the previous reports of rosy job picture is not quite as good because they revise it down when they go back and actually look at the numbers and take the time to go through them and report them. Now, I don't really trust government's reporting, and this is one of the reasons why, but even when they go back and revise, it's always lower, which tells you the, the headline number that comes out every month is never correct. It's never even close to being correct, and that's all that you need to know about the government job numbers. Yes, I'm very cynical about this, but I've been watching it for about 15 years, and this it's the same thing, but it's even on steroids now. And once you watch it that long and you know what they do and how it's reported and you realize that their methodology is not perfect, I mean, that's just what you have to say about it. All right, much of the, uh, the rise in employment was government jobs, so we have the return of government jobs. Post the recession 2008-2009, the Great Recession, the government jobs actually fell as a percentage of overall jobs in the economy. There was a recovery made on the private sector jobs, corporate jobs, that type of thing. But now the government is starting to hire again, and they're doing most of the hiring so the government jobs are returning as the private sector begins to spin off because earnings aren't great and they can't afford that much labor. Employment costs rose 1.1% on the quarter for the third quarter, mostly due to the union agreements, but also across the board. And that's the ninth straight quarterly rise. That's great for workers. However, it's not rising as fast as inflation. So it's not as great as one may think. And on the if we're looking at the negative to that report, it's one that the rates aren't keeping up with inflation, but two, that corporates have rising costs in an era in which their profits are being uh, shrunk or are shrinking. And therefore, that's why you don't have as many full-time jobs. That's why there's more part-time jobs. It's what corporations can afford. And it's why less overall people are employed. So not only have wages not kept up, but less overall people have gained full employment. On the production side, the ISM manufacturing survey falls to 46.7%, indicating a shrinking production landscape in the United States, less production than there was in the previous month. U.S. productivity overall up 4.7%. That's a credit to U.S. workers being more productive as a percentage of what they're doing uh, over the third quarter, the fastest increase since 2020. So people really put the pedal to the metal and did more individually. This is also a sign of heading into recession where we have declining jobs and people that have the jobs left are asked to do more, produce more. It could be longer hours, becoming more efficient, 
getting rid of slack. Those are the types of things that happen. That's another sign we're heading towards recession. The people who retain their jobs retain them and they work their asses off harder. The ISM services index, the larger part of the economy, falls to 51.7. Now, this is still a positive number. Anything over 50 is considered growth, but it's decelerating growth. And we've seen that trend now for the last five to six months in the services sector. And that, according to reports, was headed by lower overall employment and higher input costs, the thing that we've been seeing over and over and over in the data, the services sector and the construction sector, the manufacturing sector, and all the sectors of the economy are being affected by inflation and higher employment costs with declining revenues and declining profits. On the market side, yesterday, the S&P NASDAQ markets were both up. They were up seven and eight days respectively, which are the longest strength since the fall time of 2021. So overall, the last streak we had the last week to eight days was great for the for those two indexes, S&P and NASDAQ, not so much for the Dow Jones and the Russell, but those index did, did better over a short-term streak without having a losing day, something of note, even though overall they're down on the year. And we showed that graph the last two weeks. The Russell 2000 continues to fall. It's just being basically hammered. Uh, the small caps are not doing well in this stagflation environment. Bond rates overall are falling. This is new with both the two and the 10 year solidly below 5%. Now, we still have the yield curve inversion. The two year is trading at a higher rate than the 10, but those are being compressed a little bit. A lot of the yield curve controlled by the Fed is affecting that, but also people are expecting based on Fed speak, based on the Fed's comments last week about the resilience of the economy, that there's less risk. And so bondholders have bought into that narrative from the Fed and the bond rates have fallen. And that's not only domestic bondholders, but international. I think it's wishful thinking. I think those rates are going to go right back up as we continue to see elevated risk in the economy. But that shows the power of the Fed. If the Fed comes out and they all come out and say the same thing and say, well, the resiliency of the economy and everything's great. And we have jobs. And, you know, people don't want to look beyond the numbers when that happens. It's hopium, if you will. That's a hopium report. But at the end of the day, uh, what's going to happen is that the reality of the situation is going to kick in and those bond rates are going to go back up. We'll see that in the ensuing months, especially when we get into recession. Crude oil falls below $78 a barrel, the lowest since July. That's a sign of a little bit of deflation in terms of production in the economy that lines up with the deflationary numbers in terms of production. Uh, still a lot of demand for crude oil in the world, but it's fallen back down a little bit. Interesting that I had when I was at the Texas Coin Show this weekend in Grapevine, there was a gentleman who came in and said he thinks oil could fall somewhere in the 60s range per barrel. And I don't disagree with him because we do have deflation of output, but we also have inflation of the currency. And so we're in that environment where I don't think oil is going to fall really, really low just because of the amount of currency sloshing around in the system. But uh, it could fall down for a while because of deflationary production forces. Uh, as we get longer into the inflation deflation cycle, it's not going to matter. The amount of currency and, and sloshing around the economy is going to take over. But we're still at the point at which deflation of economic activity is still going to affect prices net net of the amount of currency printed. All right. Bitcoin was at 487 points yesterday, 3543. That wasn't a close, but it was around the close. And so overall, Bitcoin's doing well. It's leading the crypto complex in a little bit of a resurgence. Now it's nowhere up to where it was you know, a couple of years ago before crypto winter, but there's a little bit of a surge. And I'm told that the four year cycle uh, should kick in sometime next year by those who are really up to date on Bitcoin and more of an expert than I am. And so overall, we should expect a bigger boom in Bitcoin probably in 2024. We'll be following that story as we go along. All right. Now I wanted to talk about the stories of the day, and I have a lot of stories for you. Um, we're going to talk about the fighting. So I'm going to start to cover the 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 Hamas um, Israel battle or fight, if you will, going on in the Gaza Strip. There's been a lot of updates. Um, the first one is that um, U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, according to reports, traveled to the region to meet with both Israeli and Arab leaders. It became clear that Washington is not in favor of a ceasefire, but Biden's top diplomat did push for humanitarian pauses. Uh, Netanyahu, in an ABC interview, says open to little tactical pauses for the sake of hostages getting out and also humanitarian aid getting in, but emphasized that the IDF is ready to begin taking the fight to the tunnels where Hamas commanders and fighters can wait out airstrikes while mounting sporadic ambush operators operations against tank units. Uh, Netanyahu told ABC News, I think Israel will fight for an indefinite period. Uh, we Israel will fight for an indefinite period have security responsibility, which is a bit of a confusing sentence, but what he means is they're not giving up and they're not going to stop. Quote, we've seen what happens when we don't have that security responsibility and we have the eruption of Hamas terror on a scale that we could not imagine. 
The reports are that the IDF forces, Israeli defense forces, have confirmed that 30 Israeli troops have been killed in combat by Gaza since the ground war was launched. And at this point, the same reports are showing that 10,000 Gazans, mostly civilians, not Hamas, have been killed primarily by the unrelenting aerial assault. But here's what Blinken had to say just last week in Israel, according to Scripps News. The idea, quote, the idea of Hamas remaining responsible for governance, such as it was imposing an ongoing and enduring threat to Israel and its citizens is unacceptable, said Blinken. We also know that Israel cannot res reassume control and responsibility for Gaza. And it's important to know that Israel has made it clear that it has no intention and desire to do that. We'll counterdict that here in a moment. Finishing the quote. So within those parameters, Blinken said, we are and will continue to have discussions with partners throughout the region and beyond what should follow. Well, there's been an update to that. Uh, according to Netanyahu, uh, they're not going to give up and they're not going to stop. A new uh, speech by Prime Minister Netanyahu affirmed the same and again put Hezbollah and Lebanon on notice. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says the IDF has been reaching deeper into Gaza than Hamas ever imagined, warning Lebanon's Hezbollah that it would be making the greatest mistake of its life if it opens a new full uh, full on war front. Israel's trying to keep the rest of this region from basically coming after them, at least the radical elements of it in Hezbollah, because they don't want to necessarily fight them all. Because the question is, with Israel having a firepower advantage, would they be able to defend themselves if the region itself got inflamed? Continuing the quote, speaking from the Kirat military headquarters in Tel Aviv, Netanyahu says he is addressing the nation in order to update them on the war. And the south of war is moving forward with force that Hamas has never seen, he says. Gaza City is surrounded. We're operating within it. We're deepening the pressure on Hamas every hour, every day. And uh, Israeli's defense minister, Yoav Gallant, uh, issued a battlefield update announcing, this is according to Barron's, that for the first time, Israeli troops are in the heart of Gaza City. He said then that Gaza is the largest terrorist base ever built, and we are going to destroy Hamas. The defense chief also appeared to reject U.S. pressure to implement a humanitarian pause. Gallant emphasized there will be no humanitarian truce without return of the hostages. He further said the IDF now has Hamas leader Yahya Sinwar surrounded in a bunker. He noted the fighting is happening in residential areas. So the Israeli leadership is not going to really do humanitarian pauses. They're not going to stop. They're going to destroy the region. And Netanyahu has said that they want to make sure that they have security responsibility. Anthony Blinken, uh, you know, with the U.S. is basically saying we don't want to give responsibility for Gaza Strip to Israel. So there's a fight for control here. And I think, in my opinion, based upon all the reports I'm reading, is if Israel takes over the Gaza Strip and takes responsibility for it, that that's going to start a larger conflict in the Middle East. And I think that's pretty clear based upon reports. I was also listening to news yesterday, and it was reported that the people that are in the Gaza Strip, the Palestinians, and I've showed this on a graphic according to the U.S. Census Bureau, were mostly young, and they did not vote for Hamas leadership. They were not around at the time or voting age at the time that Hamas took over. So they didn't necessarily vote in Hamas. So the 10,000 innocent, most of those who are innocents, didn't vote for Hamas to have power in this region. They're young. They didn't have control of it. It was a, a different generation. And Hamas basically took power despite, you know, necessarily the will of the people because the people are so young. Most of the people there are young. They're not older. And we're not talking about the region being full of a Hamas or Hezbollah or any other, you know, terrorist organization or, or quote unquote radical organization, depending on how you want to define that. Most of these people are innocent and they're being killed in this war because of Hamas. A lot of people on the side of Israel are saying, well, Hamas hides itself and that's what we have to do. But just note that a lot of these people, according to reports, aren't in favor of Hamas ruling the region, but they had no damn choice. And so that's the travesty of the war is a lot of people are dying, may not have be supporting this regime of militants or terrorists or whatever you want to call them that has caused Israel to go into the Gaza Strip and basically take them out and do what Israel thinks is necessary to secure it, you know, to ensure its security and its people. So it's a really tough situation. I'm not siding on either side here. I'm just saying this is a really ugly, tough situation. And that's the truth of it is that it's not, you know, we have to be careful, I think, in the community, what we support and how much we support because. There's, it's not great stuff going on either side. Let's just put it that way. All right, moving on from that, we're going to get on to WeWork. And I knew that WeWork was probably a farce that when it came out, this is where you had the office space that you could lease to smaller businesses. And there were signs in the economy as far as eight, nine, 10 years ago that this model wasn't going to be as robust as people thought. Bankrupt WeWork could accelerate their uh, commercial real estate crisis as it prepares to dump 40 New York City office tower leases. As an update, according to uh, Zero Hedge, and according to a Twitter report, 
Manhattan's largest largest private office lessee, WeWork, has collapsed into bankruptcy. Court papers indicate plans to abandon dozens of office lease agreements across the metropolitan area, which might worsen the commercial real estate crisis. According to Bloomberg, dormant locations in New York dominate the list of nearly 70 leases the co-working giant intends to terminate, court papers show. The roughly 40 contracts at issue include space near Union Square and in Fulton Center and retail and transit facility in downtown Manhattan. WeWork uh, has gone from about a $550 stock to about a $0 stock since October of 2021. That is a, a tremendous, a tremendous collapse. According to a press release from the company, it says the company said it struck a restructuring support agreement with creditors to drastically reduce companies' existing funded debt and expedite the restructuring process. The bankruptcy is limited to only WeWork's locations in the U.S. and Canada, the company said. It reported liabilities ranging between $10 and $50 billion. According to WeWork CEO David Tolley in a press release, quote, now is the time for us to pull the future forward by aggressively addressing our legacy leases and dramatically improving our balance sheet. So in other words, your model didn't work. You're a shell of what you were before. And that's what the market would always have supported was a much smaller version of this. People that invested in WeWork, I'm sorry, you just kind of got screwed, but that's just the way it goes. When you invest in something that's a lot of hype, but doesn't show reality over time, that's what happens. All right. Now on to McDonald's in San Francisco, an astounding but not unexpected story coming out of San Fran. Tough place. Quote, the implosion of downtown San Francisco forces McDonald's to close after 30 years. This report from the San Francisco Business Times. The unraveling of San Francisco's office sector has been stunning so far. The once thriving Irving Center is now grappling with a record high 30% vacancy rate in office buildings attributed mainly to the shift towards remote and hybrid work in a post-COVID era, as well as a mass exodus of companies who no longer felt their office workers were safe because to fund the police policies backfired and sparked a citywide violent crime tsunami. Now the ripple effects of a plunge in office workers no longer walking the streets and spending money at brick and mortar shops have darkened the city's recovery. That quote is from a zero hedge story quoting the San Francisco Business Times. On Friday, McDonald's restaurant at 235 Front Street in the financial district served its last Big Mac after a three decade run. According to San Francisco Business Times, Scott Roderick, the McDonald's franchise owner said, quote, the post pandemic realities of operating the downtown restaurant simply became unbearable for the franchisee at McDonald's Corporation. The economies of running a franchise restaurant in San Francisco continue to be a challenge, particularly in a downtown that is impacted by high office building vacancy rates and visitor trends have not recovered since the pandemic, Roderick wrote in an email to local media outlet. No word of the defund the police policies and the rampant crime feces on the sidewalk and homeless everywhere. Roderick said that San Francisco continues to be a very tough place to own and operate a restaurant business, irrespective of price point. He said traffic at the restaurant had dropped off of a Cliff, last story of the week, the Seventh Circuit holds that AR-15s aren't protected by the Second Amendment, according to Andrea Wildberg via American Thinker, a story also put through at Zero Hedge. Illinois desperately wants to ensure that within the state's borders, only criminals have guns. Quote, when it comes to law-abiding citizens, the state will do anything to disarm them. Uh, the three-judge panel in Barnett versus Raul um, comes up with the following logic that because the AR-15 is somewhat, I'm going to summarize here, the AR-15 is somewhat related to the M16, which it's not, but it, I guess it shares a similar frame and overall uh, way that it's working. The AR-15 is a semi-automatic, but with a bump stock could be made into a near automatic, much like the M16. They're saying, well, that's a weapon of war and we're going to ban it. Uh, really, uh, bump stocks have, a lot. I think in this case, the advent of bump stocks and other like quick trigger type of mechanisms uh, that were developed by the industry have put the the focus square on the, the AR-15, which anti or, or gun control people have wanted to control for a long time. It's given them a reason to go after it. And that uh, Seventh Circuit holds the AR-15s there are weapons of war. Of course, uh, any weapon could be a weapon of war because you can use pistols, you can use anything. So just using that as the test is not really a good idea, but nonetheless, that's what they've done. All right, we're going to go on to the Precious Metals Report. That's it for the stories of the day. We're going to talk about what's going on. And again, it's more of the same than what we saw last week. It's not going to surprise you, but let's go ahead and take a look at it. We're going to start with gold. And I'm going to do an abbreviated Precious Metals Report this week because I don't think that much has really changed in terms of inventories. I mean, yes, the inventories are being run off. I show you that every time. Nothing's changed in terms of the price difference between uh, gold trading in the U.S. and in London and the EFPs and what's going on in China with the more physically delivered market. Those trends are all the same. I could tell you the same thing. I could show you the data. It's the same. So we're going to do a little bit of an abbreviated report, and I'm going to have some commentary at the end here in a moment. You can see that gold trade is a little bit elevated here. We've had some nice pop 
as of yesterday's date on November 7th. EFPs continue to be elevated. What is an EFP? I had somebody come to the trade show over the weekend and say, I listen to your reports every week, Rob, and I still don't understand what that exchange for physical thing is. So I'm going to summarize it. Exchange for physical in a paper market could either be for paper or for real gold. Okay. And we don't know which. <laughs> they don't break it down on these summary reports that I'm showing you. But essentially, it's when you take a futures contract and come in the US, you trade on the futures. So at some point in the future, you could take delivery. Whenever that month is, right now it's December. As you can see, it's got the heaviest trading. I'll highlight that line right here. December is the heavier one. Got the bigger numbers. Now it is rolling into February. It's got some good contracts, but it's a over a three to one. December still the dominant contract. So most contracts exist in December. They're going to take the December futures and they're going to go to London and say, sir, we may please have delivery of the gold. And if they have the gold, they may give it to them. Or they'll say, no, we don't have the gold for you in that contract, sir. You must do some sort of paper exchange. And what they'll do is they'll say, well, my paper is worth you know this and your paper is worth that. Do you want to take my futures position? I'll take your current you know, over-the-counter position and they could trade that. Maybe it's price arbitrage or the difference in prices. Remember, each market is a little bit different. Or it could just be getting exposure to different markets because of where you may hold physical gold or hold other gold positions. Maybe people have more risk in uh, the European or UK market, and so they want to move their position over. I know a lot of that doesn't make sense. You don't have to be a trader. The one thing to know when I talk about EFPs being elevated is people are hunting for physical or they're looking for price differences. And that matters. It means the market is not super efficient in pricing because it's all paper and each market is different, but it also means people are hunting for physical. Now, how much of this EFP number that I've highlighted here is actually physically going to be delivered? I don't have a clue because they don't report on it over there across the pond. We don't have that data, sir. So we don't know, but just know it means there's elevated demand for gold. And that's why I take a look at it. And even the most intelligent, wonderful Analysts that have been covering that market over there can't answer directly for me the question of how much gets delivered, so we don't know. Anyway, on to the data. December is the dominant contract here in America. Sorry for my horrible accent. Um, 334,987 open interest as of close yesterday. Uh, 2,644 EFP over to London. And on Monday, we had 1620 over there and 359. Basically, just looking, there's elevated volume. We're going to go over into the uh, settlements where we get the actual pricing. So this is as of Tuesday's data and pricing was down Tuesday on that December contract, $15 and 10 cents for an average close of 1973.50. As of time of this report at nine in the morning, central time, gold is at 1959. It's down 10 bucks already on the day and silver is at 22.59. So we've had a nice fall in the gold price. Don't worry. It's a futures trading and the OTC trading and all the paper trading, don't worry about the actual demand for fiscal. I think it's actually pretty strong. I'll get into that in a moment. But overall, that's the price action in gold. Now we're going to go over to silver and do the same thing. We're going to look at the charts and try to infer what the hell is going on in this market. Even though it is still pretty confusing and opaque, we're doing the best we can with the data we have. We see a little bit of elevated trade again for November 7th. Everybody wants to get involved in gold and silver on November 7th. You can see that on the volume chart, bigger bar here. Uh, still December is the dominant contract, although March is setting up for the next big contract where you can see physical deliveries in silver. Now, we did have 122 uh, interest left open in November, 663 in January, but it's December is the big, the big bad boy. 460 contracts EFP of 5,000 ounce silver over across the pond to that other market in silver. Uh, for Tuesday's data, if we look at Monday's data, no EFPs, uh -huh, zero, a big zero number here. And if we look at last week's data on Friday, there was 105. Okay, so that's what's going on. People are hunting for silver, uh, physical, or moving their positions over the pond um, at a little bit lesser rate in silver than in gold. Gold is the metal du jour. That's basically what that tells you. People want physical gold. All right. Now, as of Tuesday's data, uh, we have silver down on the December contract, 64.5 cents. Close at 22.589. And then if we look at Monday's data, go to Monday right there, we had silver down about 51 cents on the big contract, down to 23.23. So yes, the precious metals are trading down. This is how it's determined. That's why I show you the data. You don't need to worry about it too much. It just explains how this darn market works. The whole reason I do all of this is so that you know it has nothing to do with physical demand. I'm going to say this again. It has zero jacko squat o to do with physical demand. People came into the trade show and they're like, nobody wants silver, nobody wants gold, it's never gonna go up. 
that's not true if you're talking about the physical metal. We're talking about long-term or, well, medium-term, I'm sorry, of futures trades and how that relates to the very opaque over-the-counter market in London. And it's all a big confusing mess, and it really has nothing to do with physical. That's why I go over it. But when you start to look at these charts, you can kind of get an idea how the traders see it and where it may be going. And when you look at a longer-term chart, which I do sometimes on the show, I'll do that next time, next week. We'll look at a longer term chart. I'll look at the technicals. I'll tell you what the chart looks like. And that gives us an idea of where gold and silver could be going. We're reading the minds of the traders. Now, physical comes in when there is some sort of banking crisis, when there is some sort of other crisis, which drives interest into gold and silver as money and not necessarily as commodities as they're typically traded. And so then we'll start to see the physical demand take more of an account. But during those periods of crisis, it's more just the paper trading and people are trying to scalp and get prices. And uh, there's also some other stuff going on, which we'll get into here. This is the COT report, the Commitment of Traders report from the regulator, the CFTC, which regulates all the commodities markets and does just a fine job, as you know, from watching my channel. Uh, not much going on in silver. Gold's going to piss you off here in a minute. But in silver, the swap dealers, the bullion banks, I call these swamp dealers, uh, have put added 1,689 short contracts to silver and added 1,051 longs. Net and avid about 540, 538 contracts to the short side. They're now solidly short net of all positions. You got your longs and you got your shorts. You net them all together. They're still long about ooh 3,009 3, contracts to the short side, which of course means silver is probably going to go down. Why? The swamp dealers have the highest concentrated position. The largest four have a 32.6 and the largest eight have a 46.8. Now, there are shorts in the producer merchants and they do have a lot of shorts as well, but the swamp dealers have more typically, although the swamp dealers do have almost as many shorts going on right now. They released 1,308 uh, dating through October 31st, which is the most recent day that we have. It's about a week old. It usually is. And so it looks like the producer merchant category is going a little bit longer expecting, ah, so it needs to go up now. But the swamp dealers continue shorting it. The managed money added shorts as well in line with the swamp dealers. Um, so, so they're aligning with the swamp dealers and not taking the other side of the trade. Uh, the other reportables, you can see what's going on here. They went net, net short, actually dropping less shorts than longs. Like I said, not a whole lot going on in the silver report, but we cover it. Gold, on the other hand, ladies and gentlemen, is a little bit of a different story. This is gold as of October 31st. Again, latest data. Just pulled it up this morning. And what do we have here? We have these swamp dealers or the bullion banks dropping almost 2,000 long contracts, putting less pressure to the upside, if you will, and adding pressure to the short side by adding 10,855 contracts, the third straight week that they've been doing this. Now, they had two months of running off their short positions, which allowed gold to rise, to recover back over the summer when it fell from its May highs during the banking crisis. But now, as we get more negative economic data, what do you know? They're putting more shorts in. I, you know, I, it's not, I, I can't come out and say it's a conspiracy. I don't have the smoking gun, but geez, just look at what's going on and look at what they do. And it sure looks like they, these are purposeful moves. All right. Now in the producer merchant category, they took more shorts as well. They're expecting gold to fall. Overall, the managed money went really long to the tune of 17655 The financial houses, pensions, hedge funds, those types are going really long in gold because they're expecting the price to go up. They're saying, wait a minute, man, look at all the risk. We're looking at all this financial data. What the hell are you talking about? Gold's going to go long. They put a ton of long in. Look at their long position, 140 to 65, over a two to one. We'll look at this position. It's getting nearer to a three to one from the swamp dealers. The swamp dealers are the one holding it down. How do we know? Because look at the eight or less trader short. The eight of them, most of them swamp dealers, own 48% of the short. They're the one holding the short position. Hey, we're just calling it like we see it. It's in the data. It's not a conspiracy. It's right damn there in front of your eyeballs. And what's going on? The other reportables, the wealthy family offices, blah, 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 uh, drop more longs and shorts, so they're more of a net short position. But honestly, they're still super, super, super long. So the wealthy individuals and family offices of the country expect gold to go long. So do to the financial houses. Basically, all the wealthy, the financial, the pensions, the hedge funds, you know, the big family offices all expect gold to go long. The producer merchants are holding are holding shorts because they have to mitigate their downside price risk. This is called legitimate hedging. So what's left, who's holding it down through the contract trade are the swamp dealers or the bullion banks. They're the ones holding it down. 
That's almost all speculative trading. Yes, they may hold positions for legitimate hedges, but the British merchants have their own legitimate hedges. They don't go to the banks to have that. That's either sovereigns or the banks themselves or other big organizations wanting to short the metals. That's just the way it goes. It's what the data says. It's not hard to see it. Put it out there for you every week. Yeah, you know, there you go. All right. Now on to my summary. Overall, gold and silver are falling. I have zero panic whatsoever. The market, whoever, did want to sell me a lot of gold and silver. Now that is mitigated. The last couple of weeks, uh, I did buy back some gold and silver from the market. I don't do a lot of that in the store, but people are coming to me to do it. And so net net, I think I bought more than I sold for the last two weeks until I got to the trade show. And then when you get into the concentrated people that are interested in the metals, of course, you know, we did pretty well at the Texas Coin Show. So overall, not too bad. Um, I'm thinking that um, there's still a demand for physical. The demand for physical is still strong. It's more in gold than silver right now. That's normal when they both fall down. It recovers in gold first. That's why the price recovers in gold first too. It goes along with that. And I think we're sort of pre-recession. I, I, well, I think we're actually in a recession if you look at the data, but they're not calling it. The financial conglomerate of media and government is not calling the recession. So we're not officially in a recession, even though people are suffering as we've been in a recession since the Great Recession. I don't think we ever actually came out of it. I think there was some paper wealth generated for the small percentage at the top, but I think the average person has gotten screwed since the Great Recession and actually dating back to 2000 and the tech crisis. I think the last 22, 23 years have been very negative for the middle class and especially for the poor as well. And it's uh, it's really run off a lot of the middle class or reduced the amount of middle class that we have in our society. And it's left us with a little bit more of the upper middle class and the poor and not as much of the meat or the heart of uh, our economy as we had before. I think that's what's happening. So most people are suffering even though we're not officially in a recession. And that you can see that in the production, the actual production data, you can see that in labor force participation rate and wages not keeping up in uh, the bubble assets, the paper assets, having most of the wealth. Um, such as real estate, because you got mortgage paper, which is traded. So even though it's physical, it's traded in the mortgage paper. Okay? The derivative assets, the paper trade in derivatives, even though there's physical things like gold, oil, sugar, platinum, whatever, they're paper traded. So those paper trades control the price, not the physical trade. And then you got stocks and bonds and things. And most of the wealth is there, but I think it's fagazi. It's a fagazi. Uh, it's not real. It's illusory. Okay, and that's going to all come crashing down at one point. But I'm thinking 2024, maybe where it gets started. I thought it would have been 2023, second half. A lot of the banks did too. I think those were early calls because of um, even though the Fed's tightened, they haven't really put the screws to things. They've slowed things down. Uh, but there's still been there was enough money slushing around, and there was enough refinancings done of corporate debt um, that it allowed the system to kind of move along. It's been limping all year. The stocks prices have been coming down, rising bond rates, but it's sort of in the, you know, the, the rapids of the river before we get to the waterfall and the, you know, fall off the cliff. We're not fall off the cliff yet. And the rapids have been going a little bit longer than I thought. But again, this is an end of a monetary system. Not everybody wants it to, to, to go over the edge. And so a lot of people have been working to sort of hold that system up, if you will. I think eventually we're going to come down. I'm, I'm not going to call a date, but, you know, I've said since 2018, I think it would be middle of this decade. So, 2024, 2025, when we have the currency failure, I think the economic failure comes first or the economic recession comes first. Maybe it'll be next year. People are still calling for it to be next year. But I think it's clear that regardless of what the officialdom says that people are suffering. I hear it every day in my store. I hear it in emails. I hear it when I go to conferences like Silver Symposium or VRIC. I hear it uh, in my emails. Uh, I hear it on social media. So we're in a recession. We've always been in a recession. It's really, are we going into the depression? And given the, the goofiness in the government numbers, you can't follow the government data and really have an idea what's going on. You got to look below the surface. And that's the whole point of this show. The point of this show and why I do it every week the way I do it and why I'm going to do it ad infinitum or until it makes no sense to do it anymore is because this is where we kind of break it down and get below the surface a little bit and tell you what's going on. All right, that is going to do it. We've got new specials coming up next week. For those of you who signed up for the specials I announced last week, the bars and the constitutional or junk silver, I'm getting to you. I haven't gotten to all of you yet with the trade show and with that demand, I'm going to do it as soon as I can. I'm basically sold out of the junk silver, by the way. The bars, I have a few left. I predicted this would be the case. I will get to you. I try to make the last of the phone calls and emails this week, or I'm sorry, uh, today, maybe a few tomorrow. So if you're still interested, we'll still get you what we can. 
I've moved a lot out already. Um, it was just there was more demand than I thought. I guess it was crazy Rob's deal of last week. And, uh, you know, but we're catching up and we'll get there uh, for you. And honestly, um, it, it's still a good deal with the way silver and gold's trading right now. So we'll get to that. Uh, I am late this week on the social media because we've been so busy in the store. I'll catch up. We're not going to have a, a normal video on Thursday. I'm going to do it on Friday. So we're going to do a Wednesday, Friday instead of like a Monday or Tuesday, Thursday. So we're pushing them back a little bit. And then also I'm going to announce on the show on Friday where I'm going to be. I'm going to another trade show this weekend at Fort Worth. I'll announce that on the show on Friday. So those of you want to come visit me out there and I'll have deals and all that kind of stuff, just like we did last week in Grapevine, we're going to do in Fort Worth this coming week. So if you're local to DFW uh, Metroplex and want to get some medals, we'll give you that information on Friday's show. All right. Without further ado, this is going to end it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for tuning in to this week's edition of the Weekly Market Wrap, put on by your host, Rob Keens of goldsilverpros.com and his horrendous UK accents. Hey, I do the best I can. Hey, I'm doing what I can, guys. All right, you guys have a wonderful week. Um, don't, you know, like I said last week, don't stop believing. Don't worry about the paper markets. Don't worry about the manipulation. The more it goes on, the closer we are to the final result. Don't lose your faith. Stick in there. It's going to get better. And hey, where else are you going to go? If the thing's going to come down, what are you going to do? What else are you going to buy? There ain't nothing out there to buy. So it doesn't matter what the price is right now. It matters where it's going to go in the future. All right. Thanks, guys. Tune in next time on Friday for more from Gold Silver Press. I've been your host, Rob Keynes.